won't meet another individual who has more knowledge about HPP technology than our next speaker. He is a, truly a pioneer in the industry, having personally completed much of the fundamental research upon which this industry is built. I am honored to introduce Dr. Earl Ragabir, Bureau's Vice President of Microbiology and Food Technology. Mark asked that I give a short presentation, it's just about a 20, 30 minute presentation on beverages, sort of an update as what is going on globally um, with the juice industry, and also these type of new beverages that we are seeing in the marketplace, not just fruit juices, but this combination of juice and vegetable products, as well as some of these milk, nut milk products that are hit in the market recently, because they tend to create some other food safety issues that are being looked at a little bit more in detail now by the FDA. So we'll take a brief look at the growth of the HPP beverage industry. I didn't say juice, I say beverage because most of the time now we're finding these mixed products in the marketplace. What are the drivers for it? Some of the important parameters that you need to consider once you are developing these types of products for the market and take a brief look at the comparison of heat treatment, whether it's a mild flash pasteurization or it's uh, ultra pasteurization with heat versus uh, HPP and what those sensory properties are comparing those technologies and a lot of examples of new products in the marketplace. It is in our category currently within the last, I would say 12 to 18 months, with the HPP, it is the fastest growing category of products in, that are looking at HPP for a particular solution that they have, problem that they have. And it covers health and wellness, whether it's a vegetable blend, not from concentrate juice, smoothies, nut milk, nutraceutical products that may contain uh, phytosterols inside, presenting another problem, and this massive boom or at least perceived boom of the coconut water industry. And what they're looking at is natural, no preservatives, no heat. The ones in red here in Holland, uh, Vietnam, Portugal, Turkey, all of these here, really their products are juice, in this, um, juice products, whether it's not from concentrate fresh juice or these blend of products that we've seen in the market. So it is a rapidly growing category in HPP technology. So what are the drivers for these, for this um, industry? Food safety, as you know, five log pathogen reduction for certified juice, single strength juice is required. And this came about after the Odwalla juice outbreak in Washington State. It is in Washington State. But they're requiring that Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria monocytogenes, that you have to demonstrate a five log pathogen reduction. Cryptosporidium has always been a concern. The FDA has begun to put more emphasis on cryptosporidium. And because of this, there may be a need to conduct additional challenge studies so you just don't take the FDA regs that says five log reduction by HPP, they may require, depending on which state you're in, depending on the blend that you have in your juices, that you do a separate validation to show that these organisms for your particular blend of juice will give the same five log pathogen reduction. <laughs> Nutrition, HPP has very insignificant or no effect on vitamins, and we'll go a little bit more into detail a little later. Shelf life is a big driver. Most fresh juices will not have a shelf life of, of more than three days. So most of these products here that you've seen in the market, they have in excess of 60 days of shelf life with HPP. And the movement is towards freshness or raw taste of juices. So what are the parameters to determine whether you have a product that is good for HPP and you want to do a juice product? First of all, you define what your objective is. 
is the objective to achieve the five log pathogen reduction or you're going to do a single strength juice like orange juice and you can just defer back to the FDA five log reduction that they have. Once this is established, the pH, the type of acid that fruit has or that juice had, has is also very important. What is the BRICS? There are many companies that are producing juice that doesn't even understand what the BRICS is. It's the sweetness of your juice or the dissolved sugar. It does play a critical role on how effective HPP can operate with your products, how effective HPP can inactivate microorganisms. If this is high, you have to use higher pressures and longer hold time. If this is low, then you can use shorter pressures, I mean shorter times and lower pressures. The product temperature is important, mostly for organoleptic or sensory properties. Packaging, it's great to have the, this many packaging people because one of the challenges we have in HPP industry is really packaging. Many food products have different requirements of packaging and if those packaging requirements are not met, we will give them the shelf life with HPP as far as microbiology is concerned. However, the sensory properties of those food products may not give them the, the same shelf life you get from microbiology. The raw materials is also very important when you're looking at beverages. There are a lot of formulas in the market currently, what they call the cleanse products, and they have everything inside of it. Most of those products are coming from sources that are in contact with soil material, so you have issues with different types of microorganisms. So once you're starting to look at beverages that you are going to be putting into the market, you have to consider these as far as what kind of a shelf life or what kind of a pressure conditions that you will be using. Cryptosporidium, this came out of a, a meeting we had with FDA in the Seattle area. A lot of the products were coming out of Central America and as well as out of South America, juice products into the US had the potential for cryptosporidium. This is a parasite, but it's a very pathogenic parasite. We also had a huge outbreak here in the U.S., in Milwaukee, in the drinking water. And um, a lot of the water products was actually used in some juice blends. And FDA put a requirement that cryptosporidium was also one of the organisms that need to be demonstrated that HPP will affect it. Shelf life, if you take a look at high-pressure products inoculated, the acid itself in most of these juices does have an effect on the product, uh, on the organisms, but they really don't kill them out. This is after two months of a smoothie product. You can see Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria. They will survive during that period. The levels actually decrease as time goes on, but they will never really touch that zero or uh, negative for whatever sample size you're using. With HPP, in most of these products, you do not see any presence of organism when you do these challenge studies. So why are companies going into this technology for juices? Basically, they look at their micronutrients, phytochemicals, they have restrovessel and grapes and isoflovins and soy, lycopene, all of these ingredients here, as well as polysterols. These materials are what the companies are targeting now as a wellness product. Because if you put these products, juice that contains these products under heat, it's all damaged. HPP is the only one really that doesn't have any effect on these compounds. We also took a look at HPP versus a controlled juice. We look at flash pasteurization and conventional pasteurization. When you take a look at those same three compounds, folic acid, niacin, and vitamin C, the levels of a, of a fresh juice and HPP juice is identical. Flash pasteurization, you started to lose some of those um, products, the concentration. With conventional pasteurization, basically everything is gone as far as the nutrients are concerned. However, when we take a look and we compare it with shelf life, if you are using flesh pasteurization, 
which is here, you can see you still have a concentration of folic acid and vitamin C, but your shelf life is about 21 days. Basically, with HPP, it's greater than six months. So you have all the retention of your vitamins, but you have that benefit of the six months of shelf life. Conventional pasteurization, you will also get six months, but you have no nutritional compounds inside of it. And here is where you have the advantage with HPP as far as getting both worlds. You get the nutrition as well as the shelf life. This is some data that we did with the Food Science of Australia doing a sensory panel testing. They look at HPP, consumer acceptability. The study was actually run for three months, 90 days, so that it was greater than three months. They just ended, ended the study at that time. When they take a look at heat pasteurization products, it was less than a month, and fresh juice, less than a week for orange juice. Similar results were also found with apple juice. So consumer acceptability, nutrition, shelf life, and food safety are all given with HPP technology. We look at some other data and actually looking at uh, flavor profiles with fresh versus HPP. They're almost similar as far as sweetness and other sensory properties they were testing. But when you start the test, um, you compare it with heat pasteurized, it was more pity, more processed, and bitter. So there is a difference in taste, whether it's a, a qualitative uh, test or it's a quantitative test. You can document that fresh juice and HPP juice tend to have the same flavor profile. There are many new products in the marketplace. So this is uh, some examples of some, and I thought I'll show a few of these so you have an idea of how they're packaged. Uh, most of these are in cylindrical bottles, plastic materials. This is a grape juice product out of Italy. It's a fresh um, red, which is a Concord style grape that is being sold. This was in a display case in one of the shows in Europe. This company only sells high pressure juices and they're marketing 45 days for fresh juice. This is uh, three types of products in, in Europe. This is a, a juice blend. Here's their juice and vegetable, and this one is their cleanse formulation. All three of these products are actually being sold after HPP. Other types of products here. Uh, these are all vegetable juice blend products. And this here is some different examples. This is a product that is more of a puree, fresh puree of strawberries or whatever berries they're using that people can actually put on their cereal or put on ice creams or yogurt. It's a consumer product that they can actually just eat it directly out of that bottle or squeeze bottle. We talked a little bit, I'll just touch a little bit on coconut water. We talked a little bit about what's going on in coconut. Every food show we go to, Especially if you're in Asia, about 40 to 50% of the questions you get is how can we do coconut water? Everybody seems to be an investor that knows somebody in Asia that has money that will make, uh, want to do coconut water. It's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and it's not so much with HPP, it's what goes on before HPP. Here's, an, uh, here's a good example of coconut water after 109 days. If you use the controls that are necessary, and do it the right way, you can have clear coconut water after 109 days. And if you allow it to be exposed to some of these elements I talked about earlier, you will have these color changes. So what are the pros and cons of HPP when we start to look at beverages? We are trying to make sure we preserve these bioactive compounds, enzymes, antioxidants, flavonoids, all the good things that are being listed in most of the packages these days. We also want to meet the FDA 5 log pathogen reduction. We want longer shelf life. Fresh juice, no matter what it is, will not give you more than a week of shelf life unless you add preservatives or heat. There is a global demand for nutritious beverages. There is a fallout with the caffeinated type of beverages now, and more and more people are starting to look at these. 
So a lot of the large beverage companies globally are also involved in this type of research or in, as you see with Starbucks, but other companies are also looking at um, HPP or any other new technologies that can give you a product that is nutritious and doesn't have to have the caffeine and those things inside. What are the cons of it? It's very susceptible to enzymes, polyphenol oxidases. Pectin methyl esterase is a very big issue, especially with things <coughs> like orange juices. Orange juice will separate. Two separation you have with that. One, you have a gravitational separation in which the solids sink to the bottom. But if you take fresh juice and you put it into the refrigerator, you will see it start to get clearer and clearer on top. And what is happening is that the pectin methyl esterase, which is an enzyme, is breaking down the pectin in the juice, and you're having something, the orange juice, called cloud separation. And some companies have actually found ways to educate their consumers. Package cost may increase. We need, for juice products, we need very low OTRs. We need a, a low moisture um, a vapor as well as we need a top seal, okay? Plastic containers are required. Um, you, although the Japanese had introduced products in the earlier days in glass, it's a specially designed glass as far as depth and, and the diameter of the top film is. But it's not, no other companies are doing this presently, so plastic containers are required for HPP. And you have to live with the fact that it is not what you see in a bottling line, with the juice lines just speeding by. It's a slower process. But you started to have to look at the benefits and comparing it with some of the issues you do have with HPP.